from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Librarian of Congress, Dr. James H. Billington. Thank you and good evening, everyone. Of the many duties that I perform as Librarian of Congress, appointing the Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry is one of the most inspiring. The 17 laureates uh, I've had the privilege of selecting have contributed immeasurably to the position and to the art. They've also shown me time and again how poems continue to expand the powers of our language and the range of our imaginations. When I first heard Natasha Trethewey read at the Library of Congress's National Book Festival in 2004, <clears throat> Excuse me, I was struck by the authority and warmth she brought to the stage. Her poems moved fluidly between the personal and historic to take on voices both long forgotten and still undiscovered. But important nonetheless for our collective memory as Americans <clears throat> and for ourselves as individuals the sonnet sequence, Native Guard, bringing to life African-American Union soldiers in the Civil War, uh, showed and showcased the great aim of her work to uh, help all who read or hear her speak deepen their view of our country's past and connect to complex universal struggles that we all still face. After Natasha began her appointment, I discovered two things I hadn't known before making the appointment. First of all, that she had researched Native Guard, the title poem of her Pulitzer Prize winning uh, third collection in the library's manuscript division and as she had largely written it in the main reading room uh, of this very building. And the second discovery was that she had just been appointed, uh, not to my knowledge, but she had been appointed Poet Laureate of Mississippi. So she has become the first of the library's laureates to hold a state and the national positions concurrently. <clears throat> the most remarkable aspect of many that I could mention with Natasha Trethewey's laureateship has proven to be her residency here at the Library of Congress. She is the first poet laureate to hold office hours and to invite members of the general public to meet with her. And this harkens back to a tradition established by the library's consultants in poetry, the earlier position for poetry at the library before Congress's naming and creating Poets Laureate. The last consultant to open up the office in such a way was Gwendolyn Brooks in 1985. And then nearly three decades since, after an act of Congress changed the name of the position uh, <clears throat> into being that of a laureate, people such as Joseph Brodsky, Rita Dove, Robert Pinsky, Ted Kuzer, Billy Collins, Kay Ryan, have all taken on major initiatives of all kinds. Uh, Natasha's time here over the last five months has shown how the laureate uh, uh, can help have impact really on the creative and intellectual community of the Capitol itself. Her opening reading in September drew a, a record crowd, members of our Congressional Caucus and the, our private sector James Madison Council have been as moved by her poems as those who have heard her read as part of our ongoing exhibit, The Civil War in America. Tonight, she will engage in another tradition of the position, a closing lecture entitled, her, in her case, Necessary Utterance, Poetry as Cultural Force. This follows a reading many of you attended earlier today, 
featuring award-winning poets Brenda Shaughnessy, Marilyn Sheehan, Patrick Smith, Brian Turner, and Kevin Young, a reading that also brought into, into view Natasha's ability as laureate to celebrate and encourage a multiplicity of lyric voices. This has really been a remarkable time for poetry and for its range, for its reach, and for its depth. Um, Natasha's lecture will shortly speak to the opening lines of a poem from her most recent collection, Thrall. And I'm quoting her now, very inadequately, but for the force of the words. Always there is something more to know. What lingers at the edge of thought awaiting illumination. Now as a poet, as a writer, as a teacher, a professed advocate for poetry and a, an extraordinary reciter of poetry, and as the libraries and America's 19th Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry, Natasha Trethaway has continued to illuminate and instruct, challenge and reimagine, reckon with and uplift us all. Our country will continue to learn from her in the years and decades to come. So please join me in welcoming Natasha Trethaway. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming tonight, for being the troopers, many of whom uh, in this audience I'm sure were here for the beginning and now you're here at the end, and for that I am deeply grateful. It's an honor to be able to address you today and to share with you some of the things I've been thinking about since my time here at the library. It's worthy to note that from the catbird seat, I have found poetry in America to be the necessary utterance it always has been, even as we have entered a very different age than when this post was created, and even as some critics will say otherwise. For this reason, I'm calling my remarks with just a slight revision, necessary utterance, what poetry means to me. Writing for the North American Review in 1936, poet Joseph Oslander, in part lamenting the national state of things, the tumultuous times of his historical moment, and perhaps responding to the usual dismissals of the role of poetry in American life, declared, with progress and machine comfort and buttons and buzzers and contraptions and clever paraphernalia and infallible statistics and the deification of fact, we are swinging back full circle to a very old and simple truth. We are being compelled by the abject collapse of a material conception of living to recognize once more the terrible necessity in our lives for that strength, that pillaring of the spirit, that informing and sustaining power, which it has always been the special virtue and splendor of poetry to impart. It's easy to see that Oslander's words could have been describing our own contemporary moment with its technological advances and myriad distractions. A year later, he would become the first consultant in poetry to the Library of Congress, already having articulated in his essay the role he would assume to help put poetry back where it belongs in the lives and affairs and affections of our people. His belief in the necessity of poetry, and contemporary poetry in particular, is evident in his assertion that it communicates the noblest thought and feeling of our age to the people. To have poetry, Oslander declared, we must have poets. And to have great poets, we must have great audiences, thus reminding us of the symbiotic relationship between contemporary readers and writers. That a great poem had saved nations in the past was to him beside the point. Poetry, he insisted, will do so again. When everything else fails, poetry will remain. Poetry cannot fail. These are bold declarations for an art form that some recent critics have heralded the death of, 
and that others have, have dismissed as irrelevant in our time. Joseph Epstein, in a Wall Street Journal article titled The Poetic Justice of April 1st, asked, when is the last time you bought a book of verse by a contemporary poet? Implying that our appreciation for contemporary poetry is measure, measured only by purchases and not by all the other means by which we experience it. Certainly, the role of poetry waxes and wanes in the lives of many people. We turn to it when we need it, when, for example, tragedies such as the events of 9-11 demand not only our silent reflection, but also our uttered lament, a container for our collective loss. The events of that day and the aftermath brought about more writing and reading of poetry across the nation than had been the case for years. We turned then not only to the great poems of the past, but also to new poems written in response to our particular moment, poems whose cultural force, force is in the ability to give shape to what we have seen, to acknowledge the horror and devastation of it, to give language to feelings that seem vast and unspeakable, but need an articulation. For example, this poem by the late Wisława Simborska. Photograph from September 11. They jumped from the burning floors, one, two, a few more, higher, lower. The photograph halted them in life and now keeps them above the earth, toward the earth. Each is still complete with a particular face and blood well hidden. There's enough time for hair to come loose, for keys and coins to fall from pockets. They're still within the air's reach, within the compass of places they have just now opened. I can do only two things for them. Describe this flight and not add a last line. House plain spoken this necessary utterance. The poem's power is also in its sense of justice, its ability to witness without trivializing what happened with a poetic ending. It remembers without diminishing. We do not turn to poetry, however, only when we are grieving. Though we may forget it for a while, we return again when we need the language of a poem to help us commemorate the birth of a child, to celebrate a marriage, to speak to the beloved in heightened terms in order to convey the depths of our emotional attachment. At these times, many of us turn to the contemporary act of writing poems. That Auslander wrote of the need to return poetry to its proper place in the hearts of the American people suggests that such dismissals as Epstein's are nothing new and are perhaps business as usual. Perhaps the critic is only being polemical. One might assume that since he hasn't bought a collection since, as he put it, the twelfth of never, that he hasn't found any worth buying, or that he hasn't read a great deal of it lately. It's easy to dismiss contemporary poetry if one has not read much of it, if one does not know the great aesthetic diversity and energy of it, while favoring only the poetry of a previous generation, a hearkening back that seems rooted in nostalgia and a sensibility not quite at ease with change. This is, of course, about taste. Epstein seems to believe that there are no more interesting minds in contemporary poetry and that the treatment of the subject matter is too banal. For example, he writes, they take to their computers and trivialize, trivialize the subject or experience by encasing it in a more or less complex contraption of verbal self-absorption currently called a poem. Implicit in this statement is the notion that all contemporary poetry is the same, that all of it adheres to the same set of aesthetic values. Anyone who has read, for example, some of the so-called language poets and the neo-formalists and all the different poetries in between would see immediately that this is not the case. Ultimately, 
Epstein's current complaint is not just about poetry, but about contemporary culture, declaring that a reason for the death of poetry is that the international attention span has been reduced by so many fresh distractions, leaving fewer and fewer people who have the patience and intellectual curiosity to work out the rich complexity of a well-wrought poem. That is, he adds, if anyone is around who could actually produce one. I can think of many poets who can. We heard from several of them this afternoon. Epstein does not mention the joy of simply reveling in the pleasures of a poem, its sound, imagery, and the play of words in juxtaposition that also represents our attraction to poetry. But he goes farther to dismiss the audience he's addressing, the ostensible readers of the column, by offering some advice that concludes return to your place on the couch before the television set. A grim pronouncement on the state of things that implies not only a national lack of interest in contemporary poetry, but in reading and other artistic or intellectual pursuits in general. We've heard this before, and it is a condition of modern life with which we must contend as we work each day to remind the naysayers of the intrinsic value of the arts and humanities. I know the people Epstein is not talking to or about. A good many of us are in this room, and I encounter a great many others across the country. Auslander seemed to know that potential readers of contemporary poetry and poets worthy of reading existed, and that we must find and encourage them both. This is as true today as it was then. To be a reader or writer of poetry is to recognize the ways in which it is a cultural force, to believe in the necessity of it. Like Auslander, I believe in that necessity now more than ever, but would, it would not be wholly true to say that I have been here all along, at least not consistently. To have arrived at this point, a kind of certainty or more precisely, at a point of faith in poetry to give us something necessary that cannot be found elsewhere was a journey for me, and I suspect for many people. In my life, it was a journey with perhaps several beginnings, neither one more significant than the other, nor a prerequisite for the other, but as I see it now, inextricably linked. My address today is a testimonial what I believe to be the greatest argument for the role of poetry in our lives. But there is a danger in trying to describe my coming to faith in poetry. It suggests a logical unfolding of events, a simple cause and effect that cannot be as tidy as the narrative will imply. What I can do is lay out a series of occurrences that, when strung together, suggest a linear path that was more likely a circuitous one with many potential points of departure, many different beginnings. Like a lot of you, my childhood was full of the sounds of poetry, of meter and rhyme, the delight in the sensory pleasures of language, from nursery rhymes to the psalms I overheard during my grandmother's weekly church meetings of the ladies' auxiliary group, the memorizations I learned from my great aunt Sugar and in school, to my father's recitations of poems, including parts of the epic poem Beowulf, first in Old English, then in translation, and often before I'd go to bed at night. Perhaps because of this, one of my greatest pleasures of childhood was that sometimes I would hear my father before I could see him. Fee, fi, fo, fum, he'd bellow into the long hallway. I smell the blood of an Englishman. The first two lines of the rhyme, an invitation. By late afternoon, my father would have finished his work both as a poet and scholar reading and writing at his desk and as a stevedore unloading crates of bananas on the docks at Gulfport, Mississippi. And this was the signal to begin our ritual. I'd have just enough time to scramble to a hiding place and wait for him to find me as he recited the next two lines. Each time he'd ferret me out, squealing with delight then hoist me into the air and out the door for our afternoon walk. On those long walks, my father would talk to me about important things, justice, empathy, our ethical responsibilities to others. 
To make clear his points with an element of pleasure, my father would recite poems, some well-known, others his own early poems on which he'd been working. As a graduate student, he'd memorized some of Wordsworth's lyrical ballads and would often recite lines written a few miles above Tintern Abbey. These lines, for example. And in after years, when these wild ecstasies shall be matured into a sober pleasure, when thy mind shall be a mansion for all lovely forms, thy memory be as a dwelling place for all sweet sounds and harmonies. Oh, then, if solitude or fear or pain or grief should be thy portion, with what healing thoughts of tender joy wilt thou remember me and these my exhortations? Walking beside my father or dashing just ahead, I'd listen, bending now and again to pick the weeds I thought were flowers for my mother. The red conical tips of the plants had the appearance of strawberries and were so small I'd have to gather a great many of them to make a bouquet. They grew in the median or alongside the four-lane highway we walked, and though I know it was a busy road, I recall only the sound of my father's voice, the cadences of the poems, coupled with my need to keep something of those afternoons and to bring something back to my mother. I can remember a particular walk in which we found a dead turtle, parts of its shell cracked and missing, exposing the delicate flesh underneath. This was perhaps one of my first encounters with death, and I remember being deeply saddened by it as my father, who would never try to hide from me the difficult truths of our lives, tried to explain the nature of things, of tragedy and loss. Perhaps he recited a poem. This is what our shared memory of the day tells us. No doubt you can hear in my words, as I do, the determined feel of foreshadowing, so full as my description of this scene with my contemporary knowledge of what was to come. As poet Ivan Bolin put it, retrospect flattens chronology. And so I am constrained to see this past in light of the present moment, my attempt to find and make sense of the origins of my faith in the necessity of poetry in my life. Perhaps early on, it was the way my father used poetry, and thus metaphor, to present to me a version of the world I was coming to inhabit, a tool for making sense of it. About poetic metaphor, Robert Frost wrote, what I am pointing out to you is that unless you are at home in the metaphor, unless you have had your proper poetical education in the metaphor, you are not safe anywhere because you are not at ease with figurative values. You are not safe in science. You are not safe in history. It occurs to me now that my father could have been preparing me through a poetical education in metaphor for so many things to come, and all the reckoning with the past, with history both personal and collective, that in order to survive, I would have to do. My parents divorced when I was six years old, and even though I was not with my father during the school year, I was still fortunate in my early education and introduction to poetry. In Atlanta, I attended what had formerly been an all-white school, but had become a black school after integration and white flight. Because of this, the curriculum included a focus on African-American literature and history. We learned to recite James Weldon Johnson's poem, The Creation, and his Lift Every Voice and Sing, what was then called the Negro National Anthem, which we sang along with the Star Spangled Banner at assemblies. The walls were covered with posters and portraits of Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, Martin Luther King, Jr. We studied the poems of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Langston Hughes, Countee Cullen, and Gwendolyn Brooks. From that curriculum, I learned that there were poems that could help me to make sense of the past and reckon with the ongoing injustices of the present. When I started eighth grade, bust into a white school where I encountered children who hissed, nigger go home, as they brushed past in the halls, I could recall Countee Cullen's incident. It's a short poem and in its musicality, its rhyme, quite memorable. Incident. Once riding in old Baltimore, heart filled, head filled with glee, I saw a Baltimorean keep looking straight at me. Now I was eight, 
and very small, and he was no whit bigger. And so I smiled, but he poked out his tongue and called me nigger. I saw the whole of Baltimore from May until December of all the things that happened there. That's all that I remember. In that strange new school, and as an adolescent trying to find my place in the world, I saw kinship in these lines from Langston Hughes's poem, Cross. My old man died in a fine big house. My ma died in a shack. I wonder where I'm going to die, being neither white nor black. Poems could show me the ways of the world, could speak back to what was wrong in it, and create in language a kind of justice. Turning to poetry again and again, it seemed as though I was destined to be an unwavering devotee. But later, something changed. I think that what happened to me happens to a lot of us. I have heard a similar story from people across the country, many who have not yet returned to poetry. In high school, because we focus so intently on the meaning of a poem and not on its pleasures, its sound and imagery and figurative language, I became frustrated, certain that I could never figure it out, understand its cryptic depths, certain that it could not speak to me or to my experience. These lines from Billy Collins' poem, Introduction to Poetry, sum it up best. He writes, I want them to water ski across the surface of a poem, waving at the author's name on the shore. But all they want to do is tie the poem to a chair with rope and torture a confession out of it. <laughs> Before that, as small children, it seemed we understood poems because we enjoyed them, heard the music of them, and could feel the rhythms in our bones. I think of how I love Frost stopping by the woods on a snowy evening, love to recite it, to consider again and again the way it voices its timeless truth about our human condition, but that in high school, I did not. Poetry had become as remote to me as a language I could not speak or understand. To come back to poetry after having abandoned it after all those years would be another beginning this time rooted in utter necessity. If my love for poetry could be said to have begun in childhood wonder, in the afternoons spent with my father, in the excitement of early school days, I could say that my need for poetry, my faith in it, began with a single poem, or more precisely, a singular experience and the intervention of poetry. It was June of my freshman year in college, and I was in the middle of final exam week when I received an early morning call. My mother had been killed, gunned down in a parking lot by her second husband, her then ex-husband, a troubled Vietnam veteran with a history of schizophrenia. The stages of grief set in quickly, and I must have been in shock. I can remember riding in the back of a police car on the way home to Atlanta. Every 15 minutes or so, the officer would pull over to use a payphone to, as he put it, check for updates. I kept thinking that he would return to the car to tell me that it had all been a mistake, that either my mother was only injured, not dead, or that they had identified the wrong woman altogether. At the police station, they put me in a room by myself. There were no windows, only a conference table and a few chairs. The table held my mother's briefcase. Though I sat there for hours waiting for my father to arrive, I did not once touch it or try to see what it held inside, what remnant of my mother's life I might find there. Like the oxblood leather case with its dull combination lock, my mother was now close to me. It was another education in metaphor. Looking back, I can see it now how the figurative values of things were there, are, in fact, everywhere. I can see now that in most of the informal photographs in which I appear with my mother or with both my parents, she is never looking out toward the camera. In one, the three of us in tight focus, my father holds me, the hat from his baseball uniform, on my head. It is summer. I am between them, and my mother is looking down at me, smiling. <laughs> 
a look of anticipation on her face, while my father looks straight ahead, meeting the gaze I will bring each time I take out the photograph to look. His gesture, it seems to me now, suggests the possibility of speaking across time, the distances, as poetry does. My mother, in her watchful and loving gaze toward my childhood self, has turned away from a future she will never enter. I do not recall the moment during those first six months after my mother's death that I turned to poetry and attempt to put in elegant language what I was feeling to make sense of it. I know only that I could think of no other place but a poem that the pain of my loss might find its just articulation. So I tried writing one for the first time since those heady days of elementary school because something catastrophic had happened. It was an awful poem, but I needed to do it. And then, in a college English class, I read W.H. Auden's Musée de Beaux-Arts. I'll read it now. Musée de Beaux-Arts. About suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters. How well they understood its human position how it takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking dully along. How, when the aged are reverently, passionately waiting for a miraculous birth, there always must be children who did not specially want it to happen, skating on a pond at the edge of a wood. They never forgot that even the dreadful martyrdom must run its course anyhow in a corner, some untidy spot where the dogs go on with their doggy life and the torturer's horse scratches its innocent behind on a tree. In Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him, it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water. And the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. I was immediately taken in by those first lines. About suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters. It was as if the poem were speaking directly to me, and I was ready to listen, almost daring the poem to prove to me something it knew in the abstract about suffering that I now understood intimately. About suffering. Those first two words of the phrase were resting not only in their proposed subject matter, but also in the syntax, an inversion that places the emphasis not on the old masters as the noun of the sentence, but on the knowledge of what it means to suffer. It seems a natural response after a traumatic experience and the range of emotions, including anger, that comes with it, to believe that no one can understand what it feels like, that we are alone in our pain. And of course, in many ways, this is true. The world goes on, and the poem proceeds with this notion, setting out its argument with a series of images as examples. In titling the poem Musée de Beaux-Arts, Auden allows us to consider first several paintings he does not name, but that are familiar, paintings that address the juxtaposition of suffering and the mundane dailiness of the world, how small the individual tragedy or loss can seem, ignored or unnoticed in a corner. I can't remember if I'd seen all the paintings to which he refers, the slaughter of the innocents, for example, but I was quite familiar with the story of Icarus. My father had told it to me repeatedly when I was a child, a cautionary tale so that I would listen to him and follow his instructions. Perhaps then it was comforting to find something in the poem I knew from my past education in metaphor. What's significant to me now is the other comfort I found in the poem. Perhaps some would find it unsettling to be reminded that the world goes on oblivious to tragedy, to our individual losses. But I heard, in Auden's matter-of-fact tone, the plain truth of the opening statement that my grief had prevented me from recognizing 
In Auden's vision, if suffering isolates us, it connects us too. The poem showed me that I was not alone in the experience of being alone in my suffering, that across time and space, others had and would continue to suffer, and that a single voice could speak into the silences, the emptiness that my mother's death left in my life. This is the great cultural force of poetry. In its intimacy, the individual voice of the poem can show us ourselves by showing us the interior life of someone else, can inspire in us great empathy, a sacred gift, and can bring us back from the depths of despair. There was for me yet another gift in Auden's poem, the invitation to speak back with my own necessary utterance, to enter a conversation on the nature of loss that poets had long undertaken in the tradition of poems in an elegiac mood. When I began again to try to find in language the just articulation of my grief, I had in mind a distant and listening ear. It took me years of attempts and failed drafts before I began finally to complete the elegies I had desperately needed to write. One in particular made it into my journal, first as a list of words that suggested my early and late education in poetical metaphor. On a single page, these words, fossil, eros, erosion, errand, errant, ergo, aphasia, Erebus, etymology, permanence, gesture, apostasy, supplication, intaglio. And on another page, the words myth, Orpheus, and Eurydice. I was entering the conversation, it seems, through another set of characters from mythology and from my childhood stories, two avenues opened to me by Auden's poem. I had been thinking about the myth and how my dreams of my mother echoed the action of it, Orpheus's descent into the underworld to bring Eurydice back. Perhaps I also began to think about that journey into sleep, into dream, as similar to Orpheus's journey and the fresh grief he must have felt as I did when he realized she had vanished and was gone from him again. And Erebus is a kind of otherworldly liminal space. And so I had to work on the lines that include the phrase, sleep heavy, turning, my eyes open, in order to create an image that would suggest Orpheus's turning to look at Eurydice as she vanishes, and that would echo my waking and banishing my mother back into that space of that other world of dream, where she still exists, alive, but out of reach. It was perhaps my own articulation of the idea that about suffering, they were never wrong. Here's the poem. Myth. I was asleep while you were dying. It's as if you slip through some rift, a hollow I make between my slumber and my waking. The Erebus I keep you in, still trying not to let go. You'll be dead again tomorrow, but in dreams you live, so I try taking you back into morning. Sleep heavy, turning, my eyes open, I find you do not follow. Again and again, this constant forsaking. Again and again, this constant forsaking. My eyes open, I find you do not follow. You back into morning, sleep heavy, turning. But in dreams you live, so I try taking, not to let go. You'll be dead again tomorrow. The Erebus I keep you in, still trying. I make between my slumber and my waking. It's as if you slip through some rift, a hollow. I was asleep while you were dying. 
Looking back on the experience of writing the poem, I can see that Auden's words, giving way to my own necessary utterance, offered many gifts. Most of all, the realization that poetry could bring my mother back to me in the experience of intense emotion evoked by the rhythms of syntax, the heft of certain words on the tongue, and the vividness of imagery and figurative language that can make the mind leap to a new apprehension of things. No longer closed to me, my mother could be resurrected in the sacred language of a poem, brought back for a moment of recollection, a stay against the inevitable through the bittersweet pleasures of the elegy. Years later, I'd find another poem, this time by a contemporary poet, Liesel Mueller, that spoke to me in the way that Auden's had, but even more directly as it seemed to describe exactly my experience. You'll hear in it also echoes of Auden. When I am asked, when I am asked how I began writing poems, I talk about the indifference of nature. It was soon after my mother died, a brilliant June day everything blooming. I sat on a gray stone bench in a lovingly planted garden, but the day lilies were as deaf as the ears of drunken sleepers, and the roses curved inward. Nothing was black or broken, and not a leaf fell, and the sun blared endless commercials for summer holidays. I sat on a gray stone bench ringed with the ingenue faces of pink and white impatience and placed my grief in the mouth of language, the only thing that would grieve with me. Let me repeat that line, the only thing that would grieve with me. In that simple invocation of the power of language, I find again what is not only comforting, but revolutionary about poetry, its communal nature, how one can be absolutely alone with it, but at once part of something larger, ancient, and ongoing. Grieve not as others grieve, I heard a minister preach at a funeral. His sermon, not to comfort those who were grieving, but to inspire ever more religious devotion in the believers who were promised, because of their faith, the afterlife. Poetry offers a different kind of solace here on earth. I know it because it happened to me. If this were a tent revival for poetry, this would be my testimony. I see now, in our contemporary moment, that there is more necessity than ever to receive the gifts that poetry offers. Each day we are faced with sound bites and catchphrases, deadening and trivializing our language, the widening gulf of our ideological differences, eroding civil discourse, and our ability to genuinely communicate with each other. For all of that, poetry is the corrective the sacred language that allows us to connect across time and space, across all the things in everyday life that separate us and would destroy us. That's because poetry allows us to reckon with our troubled past and to imagine a better, more just society at which we must work each day to build. It invokes in us the better angels of our nature, evokes our most humane impulses to engage the humanity of others through the projection of our own emotional knowledge, our empathetic understanding, the best knowledge we have for dealing with each other. And deal with each other, we must. I have faith in poetry's ability to help us do so, to wield its ennobling influence on us, and to save us, perhaps not as a nation, but one life at a time like mine. Thank you.
This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.